Today I want to talk to you about Sutton Hoo. Sutton Hoo is a very interesting site. I was very lucky I dug there. I did a season there under Martin Carver. The story starts. Back in the 30s, the site of Sutton Hoo was owned by Colonel and Mrs. Pretty. Mrs. Pretty noticed there were mounds all over the property, excavated and found Hello, there's more to this. Called in, I think it was the Cambridge archaeological people, and they excavated a mound. Now in this mound, they found rows of ship rivets in a boat shape. The boat was about 90 foot long, and there were various treasures, which you could see at the British Museum, but they were finely made. The trouble with Sutton Hoo, like a lot of Saxon sites, is that the soil is acidic. I went there in the 80s. So how do we know there were bodies? Well, imagine muddy water and a person in it, in an outline. And what we had when we excavated this was a 3D image of a person. All we had left that was organic was a little bit of uh, tooth material. If you look closely, you could see that they had hair down to here. That's very interesting in the sense that Long hair was a sense of power. There were approximately 200 graves we found on there and they were all cut to specific shapes. Some were multiple graves. Some were graves of people who were hanged. You could see the neck was broken. Some people were face down and tied. There were multiple deaths. There was a man sitting with his hands tied behind his back. Another one in the same position with his legs over his shoulders. But the most interesting one of this was what we called the ploughman and we excavated it, there was a broken plough and he looked like he was leaping like that. Saxons very often reoccupied Neolithic sites and there's no, there's no exception and what they did they ploughed the land to ritually purify it the plough was broken and the man ploughing was sacrificed and buried but if you could imagine yourself back in the 600s going down the river Deben and about you, you could see these massive mounds. As far as we know, these were the mounds of a royal family called the Wolfingas, King Wolfo being the original. The royal mound, as it's been known as, we think was King Redwald, who was an East Anglian king, or a powerful warlord. King is, uh, what is interesting, if you go there and look at the mound, they've got the outline of the ship, and there's a circle, and that's where Henry VIII sent out a treasure hunter, for want of a better word, and he dug down, nothing there, boss, went back. Twelve inches away from that was the gold belt buckle. Had they found that, the whole place would have been levelled and taken away. But also, in about oh, 1850s, a mound was opened and looted by the Royal Navy. We found pieces of... Uh, gold from rivets from the belt buckle, there were bits of broken glass, ship nails were sent off and sold for 10 and 6. It also suffered another indignity in the Second World War where it was used as a training ground. And a lot of people don't understand this, it's very dangerous at times digging on there because you're liable, as one poor man did, stick his trowel through a two and a half inch milter shell. You will find in 303 bullets, you have to be so very careful. So anyway, that's by the by. But one of the interesting things that we found was his purse. So we think it was an ivory lid, but inside were 37 coins. Now each of these coins came from the Franks and each one was different. And we think, this is the only postulation on the academics, that they were areas paying tribute to him. We don't know, but that seems the most likely thing. There were a couple of ingots as well. The treasures themselves bear a striking resemblance to the Staffordshire hoard. Uh, they are golden garnets and they are beautifully made. The cloisonne, which means the, share, the shape, if you can imagine. There's gold leaf underneath. You have like a cage made of gold. And they're millefiori glass and garnets. Millefiori is, if you imagine, a series of rods heated up to the consistency of chewing gum, put in that cell and then broken off and polished. And you've got Millefiori. And it's fantastically wealthy. 
But the more interesting thing is, all of these things are in everyday use. The shield with the ravens, a particular favourite of mine, has got signs of repair on it. The helmet. If you see, if you go to the British Museum and look at the reconstruction made by our good friend Niagara Lawton, you could see the fantastic detail. And it's very clever. If you look at it in one way, it's Christian. If you look at it another way, it's wholly pagan. And when we understand that Redwald was a pagan, he was converted to Christianity, but had an, an altar to Thor, and his wife was Christian. How do we know he was Christian? Well, in amongst all the other bits we found were two spoons marked Solus and Paulus, and that was his baptismal name, Paul. There were ten Byzantine dishes. There's all sorts of stuff there. It is well worth a visit if you go to the British Museum. There is a whole gallery of this kind of stuff. So, what is the importance of Sutton Who? Well, it's one of the most, well, it is basically the richest Saxon hoard we found. Possibly the Staffordshire hoard might be worth more, I don't know. It's just a matter of numbers. But what we do know is, if we look at Beowulf, we can see traces of the burial rites where they cremate the body. Well, was there a body there or not? That was one of the things we had to ask. Well, there are now chemical tests done to prove that there was a body there. But there is evidence of a ring of spears and perhaps the riders rode round it like they did in Beowulf and Lord of the Rings. It's a useful document, Beowulf. Uh, we can look at it and compare. We found musical instruments, one of which has been reproduced, and there's a chap who can play it, and quite melodic. But there's, it's a very rich site and well worth a visit. If you've got the chance, go and see it. There are other mounds which haven't been excavated. They've excavated some, but they left others. And uh, let's hope they reveal even more information. You see, People only think, oh, it's a treasure, treasure ship. Well, yes, there is gold and silver, but there is also, if you take it in context, there are domestic things. And the things that are missing, like rich silks, wools, and we think that was adorned as well in the burial chamber there. But if we take it even further down to the Neolithic, we've got hearths. We had a, a chap from Algeria, Abdul, if you're listening, if you watch it, hi there. Abdul was an amazing guy and they excavated and they found a hearth and Abdul said that is just the same as what my mother had. We found flints, flint workings and I learned the difference between a manufactured flint and a natural break flint by picking them up and looking at them. I went through them with Abdul and he told me yes that's right, that's wrong. There was a couple of arrowheads found as well. So it's not just one site, and then if you look, if you go to the edge of the site, you can see a series of horizons, and you could do that actually if you're in Derbyshire, go to St Peter's Church, stand on the hill, and you'll see various horizons through different ages. It's quite fun to do that. But uh, anyway, as I say, that's basically a very, very rough surmise of Sutton Hoo. If you're interested, Professor Carver's book. The age of Sutton Hoo goes into far greater detail. So, till we meet again, far here. Bye. Don't forget to subscribe.